Welcome to the MCAT Basics Podcast, brought to you by the physicians at Med School Coach. Each week, Sam Smith breaks down high yield MCAT topics so you can score as high as possible on test day. Hello, I am Sam Smith, and this is Sam's MCAT Basics. This podcast covers the most important topics put out on the AAMC MCAT each year. And I determined this list by going through all the official practice materials that the AAMC puts out and also some third-party practice material and just put together this big list of topics that consistently kept on showing up and um, ranked those topics and um, made podcasts out of it. This podcast is the first in a series of podcasts covering genetics. So this one's going to cover some basic laws that rule genetics, evolution, chromosome theory, mitosis and meiosis, and you should definitely pay attention there because that's a huge topic on the MCAT. And I'm also going to cover inheritance patterns. And this is one of those topics that's going to be super high yield. You're going to see at least five of these kind of questions on the biological and biochemical foundations of a living systems section of the MCAT. And just a note, it is very information dense. So listen to this multiple times. Listen to it forwards, backwards, inverse, whatever you got to do to get the information into your brain. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about here is a little bit of background on genetics of, um, you know, how the field kind of developed and what some important discoveries were and some important scientists that um, first kind of worked in this field and first made a lot of discoveries. And I want to talk a little bit about Mendel, Gregor Mendel, who was kind of known as the father of genetics. And then I'm going to also talk about Charles Darwin and Walter Fleming. So Gregor Mendel is a scientist that was alive and living in the 1800s and is most well known for his experiments with pea plants. So in Mendel's early experiments, he worked with or he tried to kind of play with seven different characteristics of pea plants. And so that was plant height, the pod shape, the color, seed shape, and seed color, and flower position and flower color. So taking seed color as an example, Mendel showed that when um, breeding a yellow pea and a green pea that were true yellow and true green, um, their offering, their offsprings their offspring always produce yellow seeds. However, in the next generation, say you took these yellow seeded um, offspring that you just made and you breed them, he noticed that the green peas appeared in a ratio of one to three. Um, So there was one green pea and three yellow. And so to explain this phenomenon, Mendel coined the terms recessive and dominant to refer to certain traits. And more importantly for the MCAT, Mendel came up with three different laws. And uh, first of all, it's important to note that all of the three of these laws have exceptions, but they laid the groundwork for modern genetics. So the first law was called the law of segregation that said that each inherited trait is defined by a gene pair. So parental genes are randomly separated to the sex cell so that sex cells contain only uh, one gene of the pair. Therefore, the offspring inherits a pair of these alleles, one from each parent. Um, And the second law that Mendel came up with is called the law of independent assortment. And so this basically says that genes for different traits are sorted separately from one another so that the inheritance of one trait is not dependent on the inheritance of another trait. However, we now know that certain genes can actually be linked together. That's important to remember when you are thinking of this law, that it's a major exception. And lastly, Mendel came up with the law of dominance that says an organism with alternate forms of a gene will express the form of that gene that is dominant. And so I will later on discuss some of the exceptions to that law. Um, importantly, though, know, know those laws um, for the MCAT. The next important figure in genetics I want to talk about is Darwin. 
Right, so Charles Darwin came up with the theory of evolution. So he uh, visited an island. I'm sure you know the story. Some, I believe it was in Galapagos. And um, was basically going out and checking out all these different bird populations and noticing that these birds all had these certain features that gave them advantages based on where that certain population lived. And you notice, though, that they were all, um, I think, from the same species. Or, you know, they're all the same birds, but he basically said they diverged at some point. They all started living in different places, developed their own um, distinct mutations that had advantages. So um, he, ha he, he had five uh, main ob observations in when he was um, formally formulating his theory of evolution. It was number one was that all species have such great uh, potential fertility that their population size would increase exponentially if all individuals that were born go on to reproduce successfully. In other words, Animals are not limited by their fertility. They can make babies easily. He's getting at the point here that animals must be able to survive for long enough in order to reproduce. They're not limited by their fertility. Instead, they're limited by their survival. Number two, he recognized that populations tend to remain stable in size, except for seasonal fluctuations. Um, you know, a good example of this is how the population spikes in, um, I believe it is August, and so um, in the U.S. And so you can look back and say, okay, well, <clears throat> August babies were most likely conceived in early February. And so you look back, what happens in early February? Well, it's the Super Bowl, you probably guessed. So what happens is these people, um, you know, Based on that time, everyone gets very happy, gets excited. Um, you know, the men get very excited, and they have lots of babies. And so um, that would be an example of a seasonal fluctuation. And um, this example was completely made up, but you get the point. Darwin's third observation was that environmental resources, um, such as food and shelter, are limited in um, these populations he was observing. And the fourth observation was that individuals of a population vary very extensively in their characteristics um, to the extent in which two individuals, there's no two individuals that are exactly alike. And this impacts their own ability to survive and reproduce. And his fifth op observation was that much of this variation between individuals is genetic and therefore heritable. On this basis, Darwin formed his theory of evolution. Um, he coined the little phrase descent with modification, which basically is the idea that its species change over time, which give rise to new species, which all share a common ancestor. And he said that, these, that, that the mechanism for evolution is natural selection. Natural selection is the idea that organisms that are better adapted for survival in their environment tend to live for longer and because they live for longer, they tend to produce more offspring. I want to make it very clear here, too. It's not, natural selection doesn't work because it makes something live for longer. You know, natural selection could make an organism live for longer, but if it diminishes their ability to reproduce, it's, it's not going to be natural selection. So natural selection hinges on the fact that it helps organisms produce more offspring. That's the biggest key, more offspring. All right, so now that I've talked a little bit about um, the early important genetic figures, you know, Mendel's work, and then also the theory of, of evolution put out by Charles Darwin, I'm going to talk about chromosomes and DNA. In the middle of the 19th century, Walther Fleming, an anatomist from Germany, discovered a fibrous structure within the nucleus of the cell. He named this structure chromatin, but what he actually discovered is what we now know as chromosomes. And so by observing this chromatin, 
Walther correctly worked out how chromosomes separate during cell division, which is mitosis. And later on, American Walter, Walter Sutton found it possible to distinguish individual chromosomes undergoing um, meiosis. And uh, he did this by looking at the testes of grasshoppers. And he was able to correctly identify the sex chromosome. And in his in the closing statement of his 1902 paper, he summed up the chromosomal theory of inheritance based around three principles. Number one, chromosomes contain some kind of genetic material. Number two, chromosomes are passed from parent to offspring. And number three, chromosomes are found in pairs in the nucleus of most cells. And during meiosis, these pairs separate to form daughter cells. And he also noticed that during the formation of egg and sperm cells, chromosomes separate. And lastly, he noticed that each parent contributes one set of chromosomes to its offsprings. So one important thing to obviously know for the MCAT is how many chromosomes humans have. So humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes called homologous pairs. So that's 46 in total. Um, individual chromosomes and uh, each of these chromosomes has two chromatids so uh, and these are called sister chromatids so you have 92 chromatids and during active cell division when the cell is replicated its dna and it looks like that classic x you've seen this is when it's got that 92 chromatids however <clears throat> after the cell has gone uh, undergone division, it only has 46 chromatids because you no longer have that replicated copy of the chromatid. And you'll definitely get a better understanding of this when I start to talk about mitosis and meiosis. And so there's another term you're definitely going to see on the MCAT called ploidy. And what is ploidy? There's, I mean, the, probably the most confusing questions I've seen on the MCAT are about ploidy. And so um, ploidy is the number of sets of chromosomes. In a cell. So for humans, we have two sets of chromosomes, one from our mother, one from our father. So we are said to be a diploid organism. And so you have to remember this is sets of chromosomes we're talking about. We're not talking about, uh, we're not talking about sister chromatids. That has to do with something else. So when you think about sets of chromosomes, think about ploidy. Another example of ploidy is trisomy 21. So this is uh, has been implicated in Down syndrome. So that's when we have three different um, chromosome 21s, um, again called trisomy. Uh, think about ploidy, that's three sets of chromosomes. So again, <clears throat> humans have 23 chromosomes, and of these chromosomes, one of them um, are the sex chromosomes. And so these sex chromosomes are chromosome 23, and um, these are either the X or the Y chromosome. And so males have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, and females have two X chromosomes. However, something important to remember, uh, something that I didn't really know, is just because a male has a Y chromosome doesn't necessarily mean that all of the Genes related to male characteristics come from that Y chromosome. It's, it's a little more complicated and convoluted. And so something kind of interesting is that some of the genes that play a role in penis size are actually found on the X chromosome. So you do the math now on what is partially inherited from your mother. It's worth noting, too, that it might not exactly work this way. You know, if you know more about this topic than I do, you know, don't be mad at me. But I thought this was kind of an interesting example of how not all genes on the Y chromosome relate to, you know, giving you your male characteristics. Another important uh, little subtopic here I'm going to mention is X in, X in activation. And so you might see this at some point on the MCAT. Um, so as I just said, women have two X chromosomes. However, you, your body needs to make sure that you don't produce twice as much of the proteins encoded by the X chromosome, right? Because you have two of them. Well, 
one of these X chromosomes is inactivated. And so once it's inactivated, it becomes what's called a bar body. And the bar body is uh, transcriptionally inactive and tightly wound heterochromatin. And so what is heterochromatin? Uh, well, it's another term you're going to want to know. And it just means tightly packed DNA. That is not actively transcribing genes um, that make proteins. And so this is closed up um, DNA that can not produce proteins or is much worse at producing proteins than um, the other form, which is called euchromatin, which is loosely packed, actively transcribing DNA. And so I wanted to mention real fast, an interesting case that involves euchromatin and heterochromatin is in the retrovirus, retrovirus called HIV, which if you've heard of, I'm sure you should know for the MCAT, but um, can eventually go on to produce AIDS, and destroys your immune system. Um, and so HIV integrates its genome into human cells. It's a, it's a retrovirus, so what it does is it has a, an RNA um, genome, which then uses uh, reverse transcriptase to make uh, single-stranded DNA, which then is integrated into your genome. And so most of the time, as you can imagine, this viral DNA is integrated into euchromatin, right? Because if the virus can't really produce proteins or produce, yeah, produce its proteins, it's, an, it's not going to do anything. It's just going to sit there. However, um, every once in a while, in, in rare events, HIV actually integrates into heterochromatin or closed chromatin. And um, this is why, this is part of the reason why HIV is so hard to cure because and there's something called the latent reservoir. And so these there's these lymphocytes that are infected with HIV that have this genome that's integrated into this closed off portion of the DNA. So it's not necessarily producing any viral proteins. There's no sign that this cell is actually infected with the virus um, until, of course, it's activated. And now you start producing different proteins, you know, your chromatin, um, structure changes, and now let's say you start making these viral proteins. Well, now, uh, now you're making the virus again. So, in other words, you can make these drugs that are targeted at these cells, but if you if these cells aren't actively producing viral proteins, you're not going to be able to really kill them. So this is a big reason why HIV is so hard to cure, and why patients that have HIV must stay on a uh, antiretroviral therapy for their entire life. And, you know, HIV is a really very cool, interesting virus. Um, I've done some work on HIV, but, and I, I don't mean to make light of AIDS. It's a, it's a horrible disease, um, but it's, it's a very interesting thing. And I'll, I'll go on a little bit. I'll talk about um, how the different reading frames are very interesting in the HIV virus. Um, once I start talking a little bit about transcription, translation, and then protein production. I will definitely talk a little bit more about this, but just know, very, very interesting virus. Um, also important for the MCAT, I bet you'll probably see, even if it has nothing to do with HIV, you'll see some kind of HIV question, or you'll see it mentioned at some point on the MCAT. So next I want to talk a little bit about chromosomal mutations. Um, so there's four main types of, mut of mutations that you'll see. And again, we're talking about chromosomal mutations. And so you might see a duplication event, a deletion, an insertion, <laughs> insertion or a translocation, which I think the uh, last one there is probably the most difficult to remember. So a duplication is what it sounds like. A portion of the chromosome is duplicated, resulting in extra genetic material. A deletion, also what it sounds like, you delete some kind of segment out of that chromosome. An example of this is Jacobson syndrome, and people with this have intellectual disabilities, um, which will range from mild to moderate, depending on the number of deletions um, from a certain chromosome, and uh, most of these children that have this deletion, have problems with assembling new information or adapting to novel situations. And then you might have a, a mutation known as a inversion, and that's when a portion of the chromosome is broken off, 
turned upside down and then reattached, and therefore part of that genetic material is inverted. And lastly, um, the last mutation called a translocation is where a portion of one chromosome is transferred to another chromosome. And so there's two main types of translocations that you're going to need to know. The first is reciprocal translocation. That's where segments from two different chromosomes have been exchanged. And this is like the holiday cookie party. So, you know, you going around, you're exchanging cookies with your friends, your, your friend gives you a chocolate chip cookie, and you give them, you know, a ginger snap or whatever. So you just, you get some, they get some. The other type of translocation is called a Robertsonian translocation. And so that is when the short arm of one chromosome basically flops with the long arm of the other chromosome. So you take two chromosomes and you trade long arm, short arm, and you basically create one chromosome with two long bits in, um, attached at a centromere and then another chromosome with two very short bits. And so you can kind of think of this as, well, let's go back to the cookie party example. And that, this is basically where, you, let's say you bring a plate of cookies and um, your friend only brings one cookie to the cookie party. And yet they go around and they grab a plate and then they go collect you know, 10 different cookies from everyone who's there, but they only showed up with one. Um, you know, shit ain't right. In humans, these only occur with chromosomes 13, 14, 15, 21, and 22. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about what a centromere is, but uh, that's essentially just the center of the chromosome. So this is like, you know, if you, if you think about the chromosome as an X, this is uh, where all those, uh, all those, lines connect is the centromere. Alrighty, now that I talked about chromosomes, let's talk a little bit about, more about chromosomes really, uh, but let's talk about mitosis and meiosis. So a cell's life is divided into two major phases, and to keep in mind these this is for eukaryotic cells or cells that have a nucleus. So these two main phases are interphase and the mitotic phase. Interphase is further divided into three other stages called the G1 phase, the S phase, and the G2 phase. In the G1 phase, cells increase in size, and the G1 checkpoint control mechanism ensures that everything is ready for DNA synthesis, which is the S phase. And so during the S phase, DNA replication occurs. And then the G2 phase um, is the gap between DNA synthesis and mitosis. So the cell continues to grow. And um, the C2, or sorry, the G2 checkpoint mechanism ensures that everything is ready to enter the M phase or uh, mitosis. And so, as I was saying, the other main phase of the cell life cycle is the mitotic phase. So after G2, the cell will enter the M phase and undergo mitosis. Mitosis is somatic cell division. So essentially, this is the division of your somatic cells, which are the cells that are not your um, gametes or are not your cells that can go on to produce babies. And so mitosis is further broken down in four stages. And you can remember this, remember the abbreviation PMAT, and that'll kind of lead you through these steps. So the P is prophase. The M is metaphase, the A is anaphase, and the T is telophase, PMAT. So let's start with the first stage, what happens in prophase. So in prophase, the nuclear envelope breaks down, chromatin condenses, the centrosomes separate, and the mitotic spindle is formed. So you can picture these these um, this wild kind of flowy chromatin condenses into these X-shaped uh, 
chromosomes, um, your nuclear envelope starts to disintegrate, boom, and then your centrosomes separate, and again, your mitotic spindles are formed. And then the next stage, metaphase, kind of what it sounds like, the DNA or these chromosomes meet um, at the metaphase plate. And so I remember, you know, metaphase, met, these they meet at the metaphase plate. And this is due to the mitotic spindle pulling the sister chromatids via kinetic cores. And so they can, if you remember, kinetic cores are these little center parts of the chromosome. So these mitotic spindles attach to the kinetic cores and they pull these sister chromatids um, to be able to line up at the metaphase plate. And then moving on to anaphase, these, once these are all, the chromosomes are all lined up, the centrosomes push out and the microtubules shorten and this pulls the sister chromatids apart. So again, sister chromatids line up with the plate, anaphase is pulling those sister chromatids apart. And then telophase, the last step of mitosis, um, basically everything that's done in prophase is redone. So the nuclear envelope reforms, these chromosomes decondense, and the mitotic spindle breaks down. And then you will have a simultaneous process called the cytokinesis, which is basically just the separation of two cells. So you form a cleavage furrow, and these two cells pop off from each other and produce two identical daughter cells. And it's important to mention that mitosis produces two equivalent cells. So you remember the sister chromatids are just the exact same chromosome, chromosomal information just duplicated. So they're duplicates of each other. So when you pull them apart, yes, you have less total material, but you have um, still the same the same material is there. So the same, it encodes all the same proteins, etc. You're not losing any information. You're losing the amount of overall information. So mitosis, pretty easy to remember. Um, again, somatic cells. And remember that it is the, the little term to remember is PMAT. And remember, so know for the MCAT what's going on in each step and then just the order of these steps. All right, so moving on to meiosis now. And so meiosis is very similar to mitosis, except for that it is in gametes, which are the sex cells. So I'm going to go through the steps again like I did for mitosis. However, um, after that, I'm going to mention, I'm going to harp on kind of these main differences between mitosis and meiosis, because I think those are really important to uh, have a really firm grasp on. With Meiosis, the acronym to remember is exactly the same, only you say it twice, so it's PMAT, PMAT. So you go through prophase 1, metaphase 1, anaphase 1, telophase 1, and then you go on to uh, prophase 2, metaphase 2, anaphase 2, telophase 2. And so in prophase 1, um, very, similar to, very similar to mitosis, is uh, the following steps happen. So chromosomes begin to condense and the nuclear envelope begins to break down. Now there are some events that happen that aren't quite the same as in mitosis. And so one of those is synapsis. And so this is where um, homologous chromosomes line up. And then uh, after this occurs, crossing over of these chromosomes occur in which they exchange bits of genetic information in a mostly random manner. This results in the creation of recombinant chromosomes. And again, we're talking about prophase one of meiosis here. And then in metaphase two, the spindle fibers attach to chromosomes and these chromosomes are pulled or pushed into to line up at again the metaphase plate. This time, though, homologous pairs of chromosomes line up at the metaphase plate, not just the individual chromosomes. And so if you go look at a picture of this, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. But again, this time it's the actual homologs themselves, not just the sister chromatids 
that are lined up. And then in anaphase one, the homologous chromosomes are pulled apart and start to move towards opposite ends of the cells. And the sister chromatids of each chromosome remain attached to each other at the kinetochore. Um, and that's in contrast to mitosis. And then finally, in telophase one, uh, these chromosomes are at the opposite poles from each other. Um, and then, you know, you have some of these things that happened in prophase are essentially redone in telophase. So the nuclear membrane reforms, chromosomes decondense, and uh, you continue on and go into meiosis two. And also important to note that in telophase one, you have uh, cytokinesis. So again, these cells split apart and you form two um, daughter cells. And these daughter cells are not identical to each other. They are now haploid. So now they have only a single copy of each chromosome. So now moving on to uh, meiosis two. So meiosis two is basically... Well, it is, um, for all intents and purposes, the exact same as mitosis. So remember, again, you got prophase, um, which is where the chromosomes condense and the nuclear membrane starts to dissolve. Next, you have metaphase 2, which is where the sister chromatids line up along the metaphase plate. And this time during anaphase 2, which is the next step, the sister, chromos sister chromatids are separated and they move to opposite ends of the cells. And then during telophase two, you reform the nuclear membrane, the chromosomes decondense, and you have cytokinesis again, where you split into two daughter cells. And it's also important to note though, that Unlike mitosis, these daughter cells are not going to be the same because you had crossing over events occur um, all the way back in prophase one. And so these sister chromatids are not exactly the same. They have some different uh, recombinations. And so when they are separated, there's going to be a little bit different, uh, different DNA in one cell versus the another when they split. So to recap, Meiosis. So uh, you start with one cell. Uh, my, you go through meiosis one. You have two different cells that are haploid and uh, <clears throat> with that have these recombined chromosomes. And then those two cells go through meiosis two and they split into two more cells. So you, in, in the end, you create four haploid cells, each with a different different DNA, different genes. And so real quickly, I just want to kind of summarize these main differences between mitosis and meiosis. So if we take mitosis as kind of the base case, you know, what are the differences or what are these different things or processes that occur within meiosis? The first is synapsis. And so this is where the homologous pairs of chromosomes kind of meet up. And then once they're met up, they exchange bits of information, bits of DNA, which is called crossing over. And lastly, the um, cells that are produced by meiosis are haploid, and, which means that they only have a single copy of each chromosome. And the last thing I want to mention is how meiosis produces lots of genetic diversity and how these gametes are all different from one another. So this genetic diversity comes from two main points uh, in uh, meiosis. So when, when crossing over occurs, it's very random. So, you know, you might have a little bit of DNA from this portion of the chromosome that moves over to this portion, and then you have a different portion that's swapped in this chromosome. So Different chromosomes um, cross over at different points. It's random. So that's the first factor that contributes to genetic diversity uh, during meiosis. And then the second is that these homologous pairs um, line up or ran, um, orient in a random way. So in metaphase one, uh, as I said, uh, 
these homologous chromosomes line up at the metaphase plate. And so you might have um, one of these line up on you know the right side of the plate, the other the left, or you might have the other way around. And then when these chromosomes are pulled to the poles and um, cytokinesis occurs in these individual cells form, you know, this chrom the chromosome that was on the right is going to be in the cell on the right, um, as, you know, the, the chromosome on the left of the metaphase plate is going to be on in the different cell. So that lining up is random, and so you're going to randomly receive one of these chromosomes. And um, there's tw 23 different chromosomes, so you're going to receive kind of a random assortment of those 23 you know, so some are going to go to the cell on the right, some to the left. And again, that random, that lining up is random, and that c contributes to uh, genetic diversity. And, you know, just to illustrate this point, um, this random orientation of homologous pairs of chromosomes alone, without even considering crossing over, allows for over 8 million different types of possible gametes. So just keep in, keep, keep in mind that that alone contributes a lot to genetic diversity. All right, the next thing I want to talk about and kind of clear up are these three um, highly similar terms that are kind of confusing, at least to me, when I was studying were. And so uh, these terms are centrosome, centromere, and centriole. And, you know, you've probably heard me say these a few times during this podcast when I was talking about mitosis, meiosis, etc., talking about chromosomes. So <clears throat> the centrosome is an organelle that produces spindle fibers that are required for cell division. And the centriole contains, or sorry, excuse me, the centrosome contains two centrioles, which are these cylindrical um, organelles that live inside the centrosome. And two of them, again, make up one centrosome. And then lastly, we have the centromere. Uh, which is the region of the chromosome where the spindle fibers attach during anaphase. So now that I covered meiosis and mitosis and cleared up a few confu confusing terms, I want to talk about genes and phenotypes. So you have two copies of each gene, uh, one from your mom, one from your dad, and this is based on the fact that um, your sex cells are haploid, um, they combine diploid, you know, you have the one copy from the sperm from your dad, one copy from the egg from your mom, and um, these two copies are called alleles, and they can be slightly different from one another, and these differences can cause variations in the proteins that are produced, and... Um, they can also change protein expression, um, i.e. when, where, and how much protein is made. And variations in these proteins, um, or different proteins produced, can affect visible traits, uh, which are also called phenotypes. And so, you know, an example of a phenotype is something like height, hair color, um, skin color, etc. A similar term you might hear is genotype, <clears throat> and this is the genetic this describes the genetic makeup. So, you know, you can have something like homozygous dominant. So you have the two of the dominant alleles. You can have heterozygous, which is you have one of the recessive alleles, one of the dominant alleles. Or you can have homozygous recessive. So you have two of these uh, recessive alleles. So what exactly is a dominant allele? Well, a dominant allele... Um, is something that shows its effect in an individual when there is only one copy of that allele present. So in other words, it overrides, uh, you know, this maybe less dominant allele or this less important allele. Um, and so, for example, uh, let's say that the allele, for brown, the allele for brown hair is dominant. So let's say, you know, for example, if someone has the one allele for brown for brown hair and one allele for yellow hair. Um, well, that person's gonna have brown hair. They're gonna express the dominant trait. Obviously, this is just a made up example, but and uh, kind of, that's kind of a simple example to show how that works. And so, on the other hand, a recessive allele only shows their effect, only shows its effect if this individual has two copies of the recessive allele. 
So again, say the say the blonde hair trait is uh, recessive, well then you must have two of these recessive alleles in order for you to have blonde hair. You can kind of think of it as like the weak allele. And usually this corresponds to a dysfunctional protein or, you know, some mutation that changed the function of a protein. So say you had like a single base mutation, you know, you get an A to a G, and then that changes the amino acid in a protein, which results in, you know, loss of some function because you changed an amino acid in the substrate pocket, and uh, now that enzyme doesn't work as well. So uh, that's kind of how a recessive allele usually works. It's usually caused by a loss of function in the protein that this allele encodes for. So as I said, alleles can have this kind of dominant recessive relationship or they can have these more complex relationships. And so the cases I just talked about are cases in which these alleles have a relationship called complete dominance. So one phenotype or one genotype is dominant over the other. However, you can have um, codominance as well. So for codominant uh, traits, the heterozygous genotype, so where you have two different alleles, would show both phenotypes. So a good example of this comes in the form of um, how blood types work. So there's four different blood types in principle. There's A, B, A, B, and O. And the way it works is that these uh, specific blood types correspond to the antigens that are present on the surface of the red blood cell. So, um, you know, blood type A has the antigen A on the exterior of the red blood cell, and the blood type B has antigen B on the exterior. Well, when you have both those alleles, A and B, you are going to have both those antigens, so you express both those phenotypes. And then for blood type O, there is no surface antigen that's expressed. In other words, there is no antigen A or antigen B expressed on the exterior of the red blood cell. And <clears throat> these people that have, you know, only the A blood type, well, they're going to have antibodies that are anti-B. So your body will have these antibodies that will come and bind to um, antigen B and will basically kill that red blood cell. So they can't have blood type B donated to them. And same case for blood type B, they can't, people can't have antigen A blood donated to them because you have an anti-A antibody that's going to bind and kill it. And blood type O, though, however, has no antigen on its surface, so that's the universal, universally accepted or universally donated blood. You know, anybody can have that um, transfused into them because it doesn't have any antigen, so no antibody is going to bind and kill that red blood cell. On the other hand, People that are AB are the universal receptors, so they, they can be donated any type of blood, A, B, or O, and that's because their body doesn't have anti-A or anti-B or anti-B antibodies. In other words, no matter what type of blood is donated to them, their body's not going to attack and kill those red blood cells. So that was just a quick bit on blood typing. Again, that's going to be important for you to understand on the MCAT. And also, it's an example of codominance. Another way that genotypes can be expressed as phenotypes um, is in the form of incomplete dominance. So in incomplete dominance, uh, there's going to be a kind of hybrid shown for the heterozygous genotype. So um, a good example of this is flower color. So let's say the genotype AA causes red flowers and the genotype BB causes white flowers. Well, then the genotype AB, which is the um, heteroz heterozygote, is going to show pink flowers. So those flowers are going to look pink. So um, important to remember for incomplete dominance is that the heterozygous genotype is going to show 
a hybrid phenotype or a phenotype that's in between the um, homozygous, uh, dominant homozygous recessive phenotypes. All right, and real quickly, I want to go over a few other genetic terms that kind of relate to phenotype and genotype. And so the first is genetic leakage. And so this is, it sounds kind of funny, but it is the flow of genes from one species to another that can create hybrid species. So if you remember a long time ago, there's a story about how a lion and a tiger mated and they had this rare but exclusive animal at a zoo called the liger. You can come check out the liger. Um, so that's an instance of genetic leakage. And then you can have penetrance. And in genetics, penetrance is the proportion of individuals carrying a particular allele of a gene that also express the phenotype. So, you know, I think a lot of times we assume that's 100%, that if you carry this gene, you're going to show the phenotype no matter what. Well, in reality, it's usually a little bit of less of a, <clears throat> less than 100%. So for instance, inherited breast cancer can come in the form of mutations to the BRCA1 gene. And so females with a mutation in the BRCA1 gene have a, an 80% lifetime risk of developing cancer. And it's not 100%, you know, it's not like you have this mutation, you're going to get the disease, which is cancer in this case. It's it's going to be a little less than 100%, it's 80%. So uh, the population, or excuse me, the penetrance for this particular condition is 80%. So that's how you can say. And then another term you're going to see is expressivity. And this is to what degree a penetrant gene is being expressed. So say you have a red flower. This would be how brightly colored the leaf is, how bright red this um, leaf or petals of the flower are. In other words, how much of this red pigment is being produced as a protein. And again, that is ex expressivity. And so this is a gene that is expressed. So just remember that this is a, this is a gene that is penetrant or expressed as, as a phenotype. All right, so that ends it for podcast 7A on genetics. I'm going to talk <clears throat> next podcast a little more about genetics. I'll talk a little bit about inheritance patterns, you know, sex link traits, uh, what those look like as they're inherited from generation to generation. I'll move on and talk about gene expression, the regulation of gene expression. Then I'll end by discussing some of the common laboratory techniques that are used in molecular biology in terms of studying genetics and um, gene expression that you should know for the MCAT. As always, thanks for listening to the podcast. Hope it was helpful in your studying. Now for the MCAT advice of the day segment. So my advice today is find something that you enjoy doing while you're studying that still helps you study. So an example for me is, you know, I, I would read books that I enjoy reading, but that it helps you with, you know, the car section or you, you want to be able to be able to read and understand text. So, you know, that helps with the car section. I also listen to a lot of medical podcasts. So there's a great one called The Drive um, put up by Peter Atia, and he'll use a lot of terms that you'll see on the MCAT, a lot of different stuff. And then there's another one called uh, BS Medicine Podcast or Best Science Medicine Podcast. And they talk a lot about different kinds of studies. And um, again, a lot of words you're going to hear on the MCAT, a lot of stuff that you might not be familiar with, but you know, at, at, once you hear him say it a few times, you're like, oh, okay, that's what, oh, that's what an odds ratio is, or that's what a random, randomized controlled trial is, et cetera. So I think do, do stuff that you enjoy, you know, but that also helps you, helps you learn. And then that way you're always kind of, you're always, you, you know, in a way you're always studying or always kind of pushing yourself a little bit forward, helping yourself out a little bit more. Each episode of MCAT Basics is brought to you by Med School Coach. To access Med School Coach services, including MCAT tutoring and medical school admissions advising, visit our website at medschoolcoach.com. Good luck as you prepare for the MCAT, and we hope you tune in again next time.
Come on, Murph. I'm just trying to I'm trying to podcast over here, dude.